me take you back to 1832. It's the summer. A strange new disease has just broken out. It's in, been in London, it's been in Paris, it's cholera. Never been seen before. Suddenly, it's in Montreal and Quebec as well. So this makes the governor of New York very, very nervous. He decides to send a physician named Dr. Louis Beck to upstate New York, find out what's going on. This is a map of what Dr. Beck discovered at that time. It shows a pretty clear picture, I think, to us today, right? It, cholera is heading straight down the Hudson River and the Erie Canal for New York City. Of course, that's what we see today. That is not what Dr. Beck saw at all. According to the reigning paradigm of the day, diseases were caused by something called miasmas, right? These were low-lying, stinky airs. So the medical establishment at the time, they had no experience of cholera before, but they applied this paradigm to their thinking about this new disease, too, right? Why not? So for Dr. Beck, you know, cholera was something that you inhale. We see this very clear picture. Cholera is coming down the waterways. It's heading straight for New York City. But for Dr. Beck, this was a problem of bad smells. Only the poor were getting sick with cholera, he said. Only the drunks, only the immigrants. As one of his colleagues put it at the time, cholera is a disease of the atmosphere. It's carried on the wings of the wind. So we live in an era of emerging diseases, too. Strange new diseases are around us. In the last 50 years, 300 infectious diseases have either newly emerged or re-emerged into completely new territory where they've never been seen before, like Ebola in West Africa right now. We have novel avian influenzas that infect people, uh, coronaviruses that cause new diseases like SARS and others, cryptic tick-borne pathogens, and of course, increasingly virulent antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Death toll is already rising because of these new diseases. Between 1980 and 2000, in the United States alone, uh, inf deaths from infectious diseases rose by 20 percent, nearly 60 percent if you count HIV as well. So I'm not saying we're like Dr. Beck, but we have our paradigms about where these new diseases come from, too. Take West Nile virus, for example. It first erupted in 1999 in New York City with an outbreak. Um, it had never really been seen at any scale in the United States before. Um, suddenly, 3% of the population of Queens is, has been exposed to this virus. Right? So this is like a mystery. Where did this thing come from? Well, an early theory was that perhaps it was the work of a certain unpopular Middle Eastern despot. I mean, of course, to be fair, this was in 2000, and blaming Saddam Hussein for things was sort of, you know, the trendy thing to do. So, you know, just to be fair to the New Yorker. Um, but that idea of uh, terrorism was soon eclipsed by what, was, what would really become the paradigm in our era of strange new diseases, and that's the paradigm of invasion. This idea that we are being attacked by this onslaught of microbial pathogens and their vectors, and we're kind of the, you know, the passive victims of this. I like to call it a microbial xenophobia. Um, so, you know, in the case of West Nile virus, we look at that as a disease that's attacked us from Africa. In the case of dengue, dengue fever just emerged in Florida in 2009, hadn't been there for 70 years. Um, we kind of characterize that as an attack of disease from the tropics. In the case of Lyme disease, that emerged in the late 70s. It was a strange attack of arthritis in children that first triggered that um, epidemic. And we characterize that as an invasion, too, an invasion of, of deer and the ticks that bite deer. So when I first started looking into where these new diseases are coming from, this idea of invasion, it, it, it made a certain amount of sense, you know. Um, but 
you just have to dig a little bit, and it starts to seem strangely inadequate, as inadequate as miasmatism was in 1832, even. West Nile virus. Okay, so according to the paradigm, West Nile virus attacked us from Africa, right? And that's what triggered this epidemic, this outbreak in 1999. Except, West Nile virus has actually been traveling the world in the bodies of migratory birds since at least 1937. That's when it was first isolated. And it's not as if New York City is a stranger to migratory birds. They actually land there by the millions every year because <laughs> the city's on the Atlantic Flyway. So this idea of invasion doesn't really explain why West Nile virus emerged when and where it did. In the case of dengue, well, we characterize that as an attack of disease from the tropics, but, you know, I mean, f look where Florida is. It's, it's surrounded by countries where dengue has been endemic for a long time. And those mosquitoes that carry dengue, they're not new in Florida either. They've been there for a long time, too. So this idea of invasion doesn't really explain why dengue emerged in 2009, either. In the case of Lyme disease, well, the ticks are not new. They've been biting us for years. Um, <laughs> and there's evidence of the, the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi. There's evidence of that bacteria present in bodies that date back to the Copper Age. In fact, so we've had that for thousands of years, too. Now, this matters, I think, because the way we uh, characterize where these new diseases come from, it shapes our responses to them. Take Dr. Beck again. So he, he logged this information, right? This, the cholera is coming down the water ace. That's not, what he, that's not how he saw it at all. He goes back to the governor of New York State, and he says, the people of New York City have nothing to worry about. All they have to do to avoid cholera is to get rid of all those stinky airs in their streets and homes. And so, instead of quarantining, the ship traffic coming down the Hudson River and the Erie Canal and into the port of New York, the people of New York City did things like burn barrels of tar. They uh, strung up meat on poles. That was to soak up the cholera vapor. In London, people did things like dump more of their human waste into the drinking water in the face of cholera. They, they actually stepped up their dumping of human waste into the drinking water when cholera was coming. Because dumping human waste into the drinking water, like burning barrels of tar and stringing up meat on poles, this, you know, rid their streets and homes of these low-lying, stinky airs and miasmas, and that's what they thought would give them cholera. Well, our paradigms of invasion, they shape our responses, too. Because what do you do? when you're under attack by an invading army. You point your gun and you shoot, right? So we attack West Nile virus with air power. We wage war on dengue-carrying mosquitoes with drones. We have actually killed so many deer in order to control Lyme disease that the History Channel created a reality TV show about people who hunt deer to control Lyme disease. And it was actually called Chasing Tail. Um, <laughs> so does this approach work? Well, you know, we, can, we know what happened in New York City in 1832, right? It was pretty predictable. Cholera entered through the waterways into the port of New York, spread throughout the town. Thousands of people died. This was despite burning the barrels of tar. Are we in for similar de similarly deadly outbreaks? I mean, I, I hope not. But you know, it, we, our new diseases are not being controlled either. Within five years of West Nile virus's emergence in New York City, it had spread to all 48 contiguous states. By 2010, two million Americans had been infected with that virus. In 2009, you know, 5% of the population of Key West was found to have been exposed 
to dengue. Today, five years later, dengue is actually endemic in South Florida. It is a permanent resident of that place. That strange disease that, that caused arthritis in children in Connecticut in the late 70s, you could only call that a national epidemic today. You know, the CDC actually recently revised their estimates, and they now say that 300,000 Americans are diagnosed with Lyme every year. So what would happen if we rethought where these new diseases come from? We kind of reimagined that paradigm. West Nile virus, it's after all a virus of birds, right? And there's been no invasion of virus-carrying African birds into our country. But something dramatic has been happening among our bird species. Across the globe, 12% of our, our bird species are under threat of extinction due to habitat destruction. Here in the United States, it's actually much worse than that, 30% of our bird species are at risk of extinction due to habitat destruction. But this doesn't mean that we have fewer birds around. The specialized species, you know, the birds like woodpeckers and rails, they, they've become more rare. But the opportunistic birds, the species that can live anywhere, like robins and crows, they actually have been booming. Over the past 25 years, in fact, American robin populations have increased by 50 to 100 percent. And this could be key to why West Nile virus emerged when and where it did. Unlike the now rare woodpeckers and rails, American robins and crows, they are excellent carriers of the virus. They amplify it. So the more robins and crows you have around, and the fewer woodpeckers and rails you have around, the more virus you have around, and the more likely a spillover and an outbreak of West Nile virus becomes in humans. If this is true, then there's no invasion, right? What's new is that we have dramatically altered the composition of the bird species around us. What's new is how we've altered the landscape. This is what was happening in Florida on the eve of the dengue outbreak. The entire state was in crisis, nowhere more so than in South Florida, which would become the epicenter of the epidemic. In Key West, in fact, even the mayor was threatened by this crisis. And it was another man-made crisis, a crisis of foreclosure. Across the state, thousands of homes had been foreclosed and abandoned. And this is Florida, right? So everyone has a swimming pool. And then the rains come. And all of those empty swimming pools and gardens, they fill up standing water. No one's home to notice. No one's home to let the mosquito inspectors in. And so all of these abandoned empty swimming pools, they become giant mosquito breeding vats. And a year later, 5% of the population of Key West is infected with dengue. There's been no invasion in our northeastern forests where Lyme disease emerged, but something dramatic has happened there, too. In the original intact northeastern forest ticks, they fed on a wide diversity of little woodland creatures like opossums and chipmunks and weasels. But those diverse woodland creatures, they've pretty much disappeared as the suburbs have grown in the northeast forest. And in these little patchwork of forests that remain, these little fragments, they don't really sustain specialized creatures like opossum and chipmunks and weasels. You don't really see those around su suburban homes anymore, right? But what you do see a lot of are, are generalist species, the opportunistic ones, the white-footed mice, the deer. They can live anywhere. And that could be key to why Lyme disease emerged when and where it did. A single opossum, through grooming, this is a little-known fact about opossums, through grooming, an opossum can destroy 6,000 ticks a week. They're like a tick-killing machine. 
A single white-footed mouse, on the other hand, it destroys a mere 50 ticks a week. So, if you have fewer opossums around and more mice around, you have a lot more ticks around, and the more likely an outbreak of tick-borne disease becomes in humans. So now, okay, you're all thinking, yes, you know, well, you know, isn't this all really rather obvious? You know, I mean, we all know. Diseases aren't caused by single factors. Of course, there's environmental influences and social influences and economic influences because, you know, diseases are multifactorial. Well, cholera was considered multifactorial back in the 19th century, too. In fact, it wasn't long after poor Dr. Beck dispensed his stinky air theory of cholera that the anesthetist John Snow came up with his famous map. It's a cluster of cholera cases around a, a well on Broad Street in Soho, London. Right? And, and this map really proved it was contaminated water that carried cholera, not stinky air. Well, a government committee immediately convened to review Dr. John Snow's finding. And they agreed. He was right. Cholera is carried in contaminated water. But that didn't change the paradigm of miasmas. Why? Because the government committee said cholera is actually multifactorial. It can be carried in either the water or the air. And of the two, really, air is more important. So 50 years after the medical establishment accepted Jon Snow's finding, people continued to do things like burn barrels of tar and string up meat on poles to ward off cholera. And thousands of people died. Repeated cholera outbreaks occurred in a, a slum in New York City called Five Points. This slum, unlike the rest of Manhattan, which is underlain with bedrock, it was built on what was once a pond. That pond had been filled up with garbage, and the slum was built on top of it. And so the ground underneath the slum was like really low-lying, it was it's unstable, it was subject to tidal flooding from the rivers. And, of course, it was covered with all of these poorly drained, overflowing latrines. Well, the company that the state of New York chartered to distribute drinking water to the people of New York, they sunk their well right in the middle of that slum. And they distributed that water to one-third of the residents of New York City. They knew what they were doing, too. As early as 1810, a director of that company admitted that New Yorkers were, quote, drinking a proportion of their own evacuations, unquote. It wasn't until years later that the city of New York moved their water intake from that slum to upstream on the Croton River, and, you know, cholera disappeared after that. But they didn't do it because they changed their minds about how cholera was spread. They didn't rethink the paradigm at all. They did it because the city's brewers demanded better-tasting water for their beers. I think we can do better than that today. Um, we don't have to consider ourselves solely the victims of this microbial invasion. You know, we, we can rethink our paradigms about where these new diseases come from. And we can craft new kinds of solutions as well. I mean, in addition to attacking microbes and their vectors, we can do things like restore lost bird habitat or repopulate abandoned homes and cities. We could rebuild our broken forests. If that story of that outbreak of cholera in 1832 New York City is any indication at all, I think it's at least worth a try. Thank you so much.